Well, I wanted to start with a game, actually, but we don't have time anymore, unfortunately. Um, so we can play a little drawing game if you're up for it after the show. And we'll start, dive right in. Because I came all the way from Europe, from Barcelona, and brought a very well-known saying there, from there, which is a picture is worth a thousand lines of code and a very well-known situation. You bought a book, you read it, there's a lot of code, a lot of text, a roadblock, also known as code block, more code, more text, and so we pass out. The brain shuts off. But then, what is this? With one eye you see there is something. Is this an graph, maybe an image, after 50 pages of text and code. Indeed, it's a picture where Michael Hartle is explaining the MVC framework from the last 50 pages of text and code. And I'm very grateful for that picture. It's stuck in my mind for a long time. And we all love these visual bits because we are wired to do so. And by the way, feel free to, if you have something to draw, maybe feel free to draw along. If you see something that you think this is like something I would like to draw. But I would like to ask you a question. What do you think is this? Any educated guess? It, yeah, circle is good because, well, maybe more of an egg. Well, I would like to picture, that you picture of yourself, that this is a very sophisticated schematic image of your brain. And we love those visual bits because our brain for 30% is just processing images. The things that you see right now, 30% of your brain are actively working on this, and also your mind's eye. And then 20 to 30%, it's also processing um, some type of visual information. So basically, it's a vis vision processing machine. And so it's no wonder that when we look at this, we feel overloaded. And we are all very happy if I promise you that from now on, I'll try to make one point per slide. But those are rare moments of relief and happiness, right? In our world of, yeah, well, think about the content that you consumed. This is our sign for thinking today. So think about the content that you consumed in the last week. I'll let you with it. Go back, think about it. If you're like me, you were crushed by a verbal content, audio and text. I get a lot of messages. I get a lot of emails, private emails. I like to read stuff, right, to get some help. Books, audio books, community chats, the Rails link, Slack chat, Discord, thousands of Slack messages at work podcasts, awesome podcasts, um, documentation, a lot of Stack Overflow, more Stack Overflow. And I really will try to make one point per slide from now on. So in the end, your verbal brain at the end of the week is completely overloaded. And your visual parts of your brain, your visual neural pathways, they are completely bored out of their mind. But what if we were in a world where drawing 
would be as much of a thinking tool as um, writing and speaking. We get, in school, we get ju just taught how to speak, how to present, and how to write. By uh, class 10, everyone will tell you, I can draw, but I can write. In kindergarten, it's the other way around, right? But in this world where this would be the case, you would have much more articles where things would be explained visually, maybe even in an interactive way. We would have algorithm books where, especially newcomers, wouldn't have the fear of these algorithms. They would actually see how data flows and how um, things go, algorithms go from one place to another. We would have people sketchnoting here. Is there anyone sketchnoting? Notes, sketches? One person. A little bit. <laughs> so next year is many more people here sketchnoting. And we would have podcasts with videos where you could actually see are there real people talking? What, what images are they showing? And we would have colleagues send us awesome emails with, a little, with some little sketches to bring emotion to it, to explain maybe something visually like Denise Yu did um, in 2021, she, how she finally got her colleagues to read her emails as a project manager. And maybe we would have more engaging meetings and conversations with each other where we would establish common ground and would not just have our own, own images in our heads talking about them. So in the end, our brains, our visual processing machines would be more happy on average. And you might be asking yourself, am I really like, is this concerning me? Is this really about me? Do I care about this? Is my brain wired like this? And actually this slide I learned on Monday uh, from someone at the conference that this slide is now deprecated. So actually, well, this person said, Rich, this is really cool with the thinking types, but you know, when I'm closing my eyes, I don't have thoughts at all. So this person is basically meditating all the time. It's a, it's a very rare thing, but it also illustrates that we are all unique and we are all in this spectrum somewhere from type one to type three and then maybe even outside. But still, uh, on average, there are a lot of people who are image thinkers. And it's really also mind blowing for me because those people um, in, in the very extreme case, the world comes in images to them and photorealistic images. So basically, they, it's like an Instagram feed for them. A, a, every thought almost. Other people, often engineers, will tell you, yeah, I see the code and they're pattern thinkers. I see files and things moving around. And then there are people like me, very dull, step-by-step -step words coming in my brain when I think about something. And think about a cat. Let's do a test right now with you. Think about a cat, not too long, because it's a test. And this is what an image thinker would think right now, like a concrete cat, photorealistic cat from the world. This is the pattern thinkers. I don't know what weird stuff they will be thinking. And this is me. A couple of sticks ending up being a fox. Maybe you know this fox is from Pognit, wise Pognit guy, guide. But still, even the, the verbal, super verbal thinkers, someone said, yeah, me too. Um, even the very verbal thinkers, they are very happy to extend their neural pathways with things when they see something coming visually, when they see something explained visually. And even we verbal thinkers see, um, yeah, images when we think about very something, something very concrete. So this world of thinking equals drawing benefits everyone, basically. But we can't really get to this world of thinking equals, equals visualizing equals drawing because, well, no one can draw. Everyone will tell you, I can't draw. 
And I can really much relate to this. So 20 years ago, maybe you remember the talk yesterday from Gary Ware in the morning where he said he quit drawing and he said, I can't draw, that's all. That's exactly my story. 20 years ago, my teenage years, I quit drawing. I said, I have two left hands. It's over for me. I labeled myself and I haven't touched drawing for a long time. And five years ago, I told to my wife, and she's an artist, and I always envy her. I told her, that's easy for you, but I can't even draw a little cup. It was a really sad moment in my life. And I don't know, can anyone relate? Oh my God, almost half of the room, or maybe more than half. And it's funny because there is someone in the visual thinking space, um, Dan Rome, and if there is someone you, you should check out if you want to dig deeper into the visual thinking. And he says there are basically three categories of people um, who say, and 75% of people basically say they can't draw. And maybe 25% will jump onto the whiteboard. Will someone, if they see a whiteboard and there is a problem to solve, is someone who is going to get there and, and draw something down? Joel, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, it's really about this, it's interesting that it confirms this kind of percentage. And it's not easy, even for the, for the visual thinkers and pattern thinkers, sometimes if you are in your verbal mode and then switching over to um, drawing, it's really, yeah, it's, Sometimes just an energy barrier that your brain tells you, no, stop there, let's do what we do all the time. So for, there is a barrier for everyone, right? And there is also the issue that, well, if there is no culture of drawing things down, if there is even a whiteboard that has like spider webs on it and uh, in your company no one gets there, how do you go there? Like, you don't we want to be the weirdo who draws down the, the, the wrong thing. So it's basically impossible to get to this world of um, drawing or visualizing equals thinking and communicating. <coughs> Unless we start with ourselves and we make it easier for ourselves. And what makes things easy? What gets you started easier? What helps you to make this next step easier. It's maybe a framework. We are here at the framework conf, right? Rails conf. We are using frameworks all the time to not reinvent the wheel every day. And we are using processes all the time, right? Whenever you refactor something, whether you know this or not, you're following a process. Check out the refactoring book. It's all the processes are there. And our vision is a reproducible parallel process. It's a step-by-step -step thing. It's like, it's similar to the computer actually a little bit. And it's kind of easy to put a framework onto an existing process. So this is what we will do now. We will see a framework to help you know the next step when you want to visualize something, when you're stuck with a problem and you would like to draw down something. And first we want to see like what is vision at all? And for that we want to look at a couple of, at a scene. Imagine you are at the park on your favorite bench and there is this scene for some reason near a lake playing out. And this is the first picture that we will look at Second, I won't comment much. First, second, third, something happened. And then there's this. There's a moon. And we'll package this example now into a framework. And this works because Whenever you want to draw something or 
even explain something to each other. You, whether it's a concrete thing, whether it's like a chair, or if it's an abstract problem, you need first to, to look at the problem, you need to see what's there, what are the details. This is also something I didn't know. To draw something, you need to see it and really look. And then to draw it down, you need to imagine, like, how will you draw it? And then you can draw. So we said this is your vision. And this is another very sophisticated picture of your brain, but uh, it's a brain cake, I guess. And there are basically six neural pathways that are engaged in vision. And those six neural pathways can be packaged into six micro frameworks of visualizing something. And first, whenever you go into a room or you sit on your bench in the park and look at something, you see what is there. You go into a room, you see, okay, Jeremy, chairs. That's the first thing that happens in your vision process. So basically, you detect the object. Then your brain tries to figure out how many. Like, is there one Jeremy or more? Are there more people? What are you doing on stage when there are like 100 people here? Is this dangerous, basically, right? And your brain makes like a little bit of guessing and mm, sometimes concrete numbers, sometimes some guessing. Then it tries to relate things to another. Where are objects located? And um, like, where's the enemy? Right? Things get closer or with time, right? Then time passes. So your image processing machine, it works. Um, there are frames, right? The, like, once you have a couple of frames per second, you can, um, your brain can construct like a timeline of what happened. And you can see each of the pie cakes, it has like a little micro visual framework. And these are the things that you can use then to visualize um, the details of your problem. Here there's a timeline, for example. And remember the four pictures. I didn't really need to tell you that between picture one and three, there was a little time that passed. And you knew that picture four, a lot of time passed. It's just something that your brain knows. And once you have the objects, the quantities, the relationships, the timelines, you have a couple of frames, then your brain can decide, hey, this is how things happened. This is some, how something particular happened. And this is the well-known flowchart. Often we start with the flowchart, but actually we don't have a lot of information yet. And we try to jump to the solution, but the flowchart is actually a little bit more of an end game. And once you know how things happened, you can conclude why this happened. It's like an equation that you can do at the end. And in this particular example, you could conclude whatever you want, but we could also conclude that dogs love birds, but birds do not love dogs, and big drama can happen, especially if babies are involved. And this is this six by six framework, six neural pathways, six microvisual frameworks to get you started every time. And we'll have an example in a little bit. What you also need, apart from the framework, is a visual alphabet. So if you, the one, uh, if you are the one who raised their hand and said, I can't draw, you probably don't have a visual alphabet as well. And that's not very complicated, especially in the beginning. 
and just about, if you look at this as well, we could have visualized a lot of things and it would be just squares, circles, triangles, and lines and maybe some faces, dots. And basically when I started visualizing a little bit more eight years ago in my computer science studies, I started with mind maps and all I needed was circles and squares. And for two years now I'm doing this very complicated and complex uh, stick figures stuff with emotions. So yeah, let's see the framework in action um, to have an example. And I was told that this is worse than uh, live coding, so I won't do it live. If you want, we can do it after. But to do that and to practice that yourself, maybe afterwards, it's always cool to start with a clarity challenge. So something where you felt, hey, I wanted to explain this particular thing to someone, but I said something and in the end it didn't really work out. It wasn't the right thing that I wanted to say. And I had a challenge. Recently where, well, I prepared for this talk and I went to a Toastmasters event and we had an after party and Someone asked me, hey, why is Ruby such an amazing language? And I didn't really feel afterwards that I kind of got to the, to the core of it. And, okay, this person, to make it more concrete, it was Maria, and she's a linguist, and she's afraid of AI taking away her job at Google. She's also a translator. And she was wondering if it would be cool to get started coding. My display is acting weird, but this looks all good. So I have now a blinking display here. <laughs> um, yeah, she wondered if she wants to, st uh, to get started coding to enhance her career, to maybe build some products. And I kind of just brawled away and I picked the first thing that I saw and explained to her, hey, how awesome the Ruby language is and how human readable it is and how bad Java is. And I <laughs> talked all these weird things, right, that we often also do with coding, right? Someone poses a problem, we jump onto it, write a thousand lines of code and it was the wrong one. And I wondered if I could have expressed myself better. And I wondered if, if I used the framework, if I would have come to a different or a better solution to the whole question. And if you remember, the first thing to do is to get to the what. And it's not that you need all the time to go all, through all the six steps. When someone is talking about something and you, you want to visualize it and they're talking about budget, then you don't need to get, get from like step one and then step two, three. You know they're talking about quantities so you can use the micro frameworks that um, are for quantities. But we will go now, which is like graphs and pie charts and stuff like that. But we will now go from like one to six and see if uh, we get to a better conclusion. So yeah, we start with the what, and there's Ruby, there's Maria and AI, evil AI, and then there are other beginners, there, there's a community, an active community of Rubyists. Ruby is great for the web, it's an active development, it's open source, it's used by startups and there are companies having a lot of fun with it. Um, it's also more human readable than the average language. And there are of course other languages somewhere and there's also, there are ways to learn it. 
And this is what I came up with. And you see there is no relations whatsoever right now. It's just, it's basically a little bit like a list. The thing that I saw when I thought about the what, what is there, and who is involved in the problem. And so now we do a little bit of a mind switch and think about how many. And, well, the first thing that comes to mind is our awesome, active, helpful community um, in comparison to the other dull Java people. No, I'm kidding, but it is special, right? And we also have to be honest that Ruby has its niche in the web space most of the time, and there are other languages that cover, like JavaScript, Python, and Java that have their, that are bigger players in other areas, and in general. And we could probably visualize thousands of ways why Ruby syntax is so nice, but I thought about, yeah, as an example, it has two names uh, per Ruby method as a possibility, which is a crime in Python where you do one and one thing only. And then there's also a trend, of course. It was very popular, I don't know, 10 years ago. Exploded in popularity, then fell down, flattened, and it goes a little bit up again, right? And now there is a real mind switch. Now we see a little bit more of relationships and how things are mapped on maybe Maria's journey, right? It's about her problem, actually. Why is it for her the, the best language? And Maria, well, she dabbled into code a little bit, and she, she's at the very beginning uh, of all that. And there is a goal, some kind of a goal somewhere. Um, and on the way, there are the, the communities, and there are like courses, uh, or like learning resources, maybe not university, she's a linguist, like a master degree. And at the end of, of her goal, there's maybe building some products, getting code to code, uh, building some tech knowledge. And I thought, wh where could AI be here on the map? And maybe even nowadays, it's still, it could be a helper um, once she has some fundamentals down. And after she has some really good fundamentals, she can I don't know, build her products or become a better uh, employee and more, with more technical knowledge as a linguist, right? There's lots you can do in NLP or wherever. And now that we have a couple, we have kind of a, an overview of our, all the actors, how they relate to each other or some of them, and we are maybe getting to, a core, to the core of the problem a little bit more. And now we can do a very little time, simple timeline. Because when someone is starting or thinking about starting in tech, it's often about, hey, how long does it will take me? And the timeline itself, it's probably she'll start with some resources, then she'll maybe do some real projects, and then some opportunities might arise. Very generic. And yeah, of course, then how much time do I need to spend to get through the timeline? That's always the question. And just a, just a guess here. So if you do it two hours per day and truly commit, for six months, and this is very hard. People underestimate how hard it is to truly commit for something like that for like six months. Then maybe first opportunities will arise. Maybe earlier if you're really lucky, maybe much later. But just a rough estimate. And now that we have a timeline, we can and, and see how things could happen we can jump into proposing a plan for her, like how would the flow look like? And first, truly commit to your decision to do that. Um, then 
learn some basics, maybe Code Academy, maybe whatever you like. See if it's fun for you, then dive deeper, maybe with a boot camp. And engage in communities all the way through. There are also open source boot camps and open source resources that are really great. And all the awesome chats and Twitters where you can, Mastodons, where you can um, get help to build your first real project, which is then the thing that might, with highest probability, lead to good opportunities. And after all that, do I have a better conclusion for Maria? And I felt that it was better. What I have actually, how I should have built it up probably, with everything that we've seen here now. Maybe I should have said something like, hey, Maria plus Ruby times true commitment times the awesome Ruby community, maybe AI as a helper for you, will result in opportunities and fun. That's maybe better than just rambling about syntax. I could also have shown her like thousands lines of Ruby code, but that wouldn't help probably. And I felt like this came more to the core of her problem. That, that was more, more like a good explanation in the end. And we learned maybe something along the way as well about Ruby and why it's, and where it is at all as an eco ecosystem. And you see, this is also what we often do as engineers, right? We jump right to the solution or try to, to do the thing, but seeing the big picture, zooming out a little bit, seeing the different parts is often just more, more productive uh, in writing the right thousand lines of code in the end. And knowing about the framework, you will probably encounter it in, in a couple of places, and it is, or parts of it are successfully used in some places, whiteboard interviews. If you ever had one, you first draw down the what, then some inputs, outputs, you do the how, the, the code in the worst case, and then you speak about the how many, like what was the performance, what, what's the big O, and so on. This was also, of course, a typical how, where you can see the flow of a request going in and uh, the whole MVC thing explained how it basically works. You could also make a where out of it if you remove the, the whole lines and arrows and if you layer it a little bit and say, hey, this is the database layer, this is the application layer, this is the user <laughs> layer. There are other visualizers who will dissect problems into pieces and very complex topics, actually, and take out your barrier of, oh, I don't know how to start with it, I, I don't even know where to start, start learning it. And they do basically everything, like how, where, or how many, and why. And Stack Overflow doesn't have to be always just text and code. So there is a 12 upload uh, explanation, visual explanation of the how of a, a Ruby map method. So this is the evidence that we can even populate Stack Overflow with cool visual stuff. Maybe other helpful thing that I found is I never could have remembered if it's the forward slash or the backward slash uh, for the multi-line string. And I drew it down once and I did some weird thing like flowing down from left to right. And once I encountered a multi-line string, I remembered this forever. So if you don't remember something, you might end up just drawing some kind of weird thing and you will have the image and you will know this is how it's actually working. And often people, when they look at images of your articles, they will tell you if you have created 
a kind of unique image, they will tell you, hey, this made it more memorable for me. This made it stick. This made the concept more relatable. So it's good for you because you kind of express yourself and explain something and stand out in a way. And it's good also for the readers who engage more. So all you need to do right now is pen and paper if you want to express yourself or write down things, um, draw down things for yourself. Um, it, whiteboard is great if you are in an office. There is also Miro when you are remotely. Draw IO, at least some boxes and circles to visualize the, the code parts. That's uh, the minimum. And I've already seen this uh, at this conference a couple of times, people getting out draw IO and do, doing some, the pattern thinkers, of course. And find those visual thinkers. So in my company, in some of my teams that I worked in, I talked to, I found those pattern and visual thinkers and we conspired to create visuals for newcomers to explain how our infrastructure works. We did a design sprint once, which is highly visual, to create an MVP in a week and know what not to build. <laughs> and you can do all kinds of things. You can also, we did some brainstorming sessions to like brainstorm ideas or make some decisions. So it's great to find those visual thinkers and have a little bit more fun at work together. And then practice solving problems. Now you have a framework or use some of it or all of it. And your brain will thank you. It will be more happy, more engaged, um, have more, more memorable moments. And you probably will have more common understanding with the speak people you speak to if you explain each other something uh, in a visual way. And most importantly, when you need to clarify something, you will pick up that pen and draw. And I really hope that a lot of times this will save you or help you actually to write the perfectly fine first thousand lines of code on the first go.